Okay, yes, we are talking about Taylor Swift again, but hear me out. She's the one who keeps dominating the headlines. This time, it's about Taylor and Travis. Today on the podcast, you'll hear how Taylor Swift manages to keep our attention in a way that you really don't see anymore. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Listen, I think we should first take a moment to, I don't know, set the vibe around here. Best believe I'm still bejeweled. When I walk in the room, I can still make the whole place shimmer. And when I meet the band, they ask, do you have a man? I can still say I don't remember. Familiarity breeds contempt, so put me in the basement. When I want the penthouse of your heart, diamonds in my eyes. I polish up real, I polish up real. That's Bejeweled. That's Taylor Swift. Listen, time and time again, Taylor manages to make herself one of the biggest stories on the planet. So we're back at it. Mel Woods and Tyler Foggett both make me feel bejeweled. And they're both here. Mel, Tyler, what's good? Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having us for this perfect conversation. (laughs) Truly delighted to be here. (laughs) I'm so happy that you both are here. Okay, the preface I want to give to the people listening is that this is like not designed to be a gossip show. That is not what we do. But the speculation of a relationship between Taylor Swift and NFL player Travis Kelsey has kind of become the talk of the internet in a way that I think deserves attention because it's a kind of story that you don't really see anymore. Like there is something about this pairing that is capturing the imagination of people. So I want to get into it. Tyler, I'm going to start with you on this one. This has been one of those celebrity stories that's been, like, basically patched together by, like, random media stories and, like, online memes. Can you just, like, catch us up on how this alleged love story has unfolded in the public eye? Yeah, so it all started when Travis Kelsey um, goes to the Eras tour. He's lucky enough to be able to get tickets. Um, as many of you might know, friendship bracelets are a big thing at Taylor's concerts. The fans wear bracelets referencing names of Taylor songs and other pieces of Swift lore. And Travis Kelsey, um, who has a bit of a crush on Taylor, it seems, made a bracelet with his phone number on it and tried to get it to her but wasn't able to. After that, there were some reports that the two of them had quietly been hanging out. Um, Travis and his brother Jason, both um, star players in the NFL, you know, they have a podcast um, where they, you know, talked about it a little bit. There were some comments from Jason Kelsey and from some other people kind of confirming that there was something going on, Um, you know, Travis Kelsey scores touchdowns in a game and you have NFL commentators making references to, oh, he found a a blank space in the end zone, that sort of thing. (laughs) And then um, there was this big um, kind of grand public statement that um, Travis Kelsey made where he says that he has invited Taylor to his game. Um, He saw what she could do in an NFL stadium and he wants to see, you know, if if she'll come and, um, you know, watch him play. And um, I think there's something about like, you know, we'll see who can make the place more lit. And then she appears and it's the biggest story ever. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it was really this like sudden media explosion. There are cameras that are sort of a fixed Mel to Taylor Swift sitting next to Travis Kelsey's mom. um, And people keep like reading her lips as she interacts with people. I I, want to come back to the the sort of the Taylor of it all. But first, can you just set us set us up a little bit, Mel, here? Because Travis Kelsey and his brother, Jason, they're both big stars in the NFL. Um, As Tyler just mentioned, like they have this podcast. So sort of starting to position themselves as media personalities. There was also like a new documentary that's going to be out on Prime about Travis's rise. And also earlier this year, this is an NFL player who also hosted SNL. What kind of story are the Kelsey brothers telling about themselves and where does Travis fit into all this? Well, first of all, love to be the token sports gay in the room. (laughs) That's a a very exciting time for me. Um, You know, I've been a lifelong Philadelphia Eagles fan and that's the team that Jason Kelsey plays for. So I've watched- You're wearing an Eagles sweater right now. I'm wearing my Eagles sweater, you know, big proud go birds. Uh, But I've followed the Kelseys for a really long time and- we had this huge benefit last year of the Super Bowl also kind of being the Kelsey Bowl because the Eagles played Travis Kelsey's team, the Chiefs. Right. And their mom, Donna, who now is known as Taylor's new bestie, I guess, was <laughs> all over the media in sure. her little half and half jersey of her two boys. And they really have created this image of themselves as these kind of lovable, good, feel good guys, you know. 
Travis Kelsey had this dating show called Catching Kelsey a few years ago where yeah. he dated women from all 50 states, bachelor style. Uh, you know, the, the podcast has really popped off. And I think we see this in the NFL right now that these guys, the ones who have personalities who can really soar with those are finding such, you know, not to be cheesy about it, new heights <laughs> in, in, in their popularity. And and you see this coming after the Super Bowl. You know, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. Often the quarterback of the team that wins the Super Bowl is the one who goes and hosts SNL. You know, we've seen that with Peyton Manning in the past, for example. Uh, no offense to Patrick Mahomes. He's like not the like most charismatic person in the world. It was Travis Kelsey who went and did it. And he right. did a really good job of it. And so I think he's kind of primed for this media attention with all the charisma that he has going for him. I do want to play a little bit of the, the Travis Kelsey and Jason Kelsey podcast, New Heights. This is a clip from the episode that dropped this morning. Let's hear it. How's it feel that uh, Taylor Swift has finally put you on the map? <laughs> Shout out to Taylor for uh, for pulling up. That was pretty ballsy. That was pretty ballsy. Yeah, I am. Um... <laughs> The day went perfect for Chiefs fans, of course. It, <laughs> so, we scripted it all, ladies and gentlemen. It was it was just impressive. It was impressive to see the slow motion chest bumps, to see the, the 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 high fives with mom, to uh, to see how you know Chiefs Kingdom was all excited that she was there. That shit was absolutely hysterical, and it was uh, it was definitely a game I'll remember. That's for damn sure. Tyler, there's something really endearing about how excited he is that Taylor Swift showed up to the game. But also, I want to bring up this Rolling Stone interview from 2014. Taylor said, quote, I feel like watching my dating life has become a bit of a national pastime, and I'm just not comfortable providing that kind of entertainment anymore. This is a person who has an incredible amount of control over how visible she is, and she appears to be everywhere right now. Like, Let's remember, she dated Joe Alwyn for six years, was it? And, like, it was a way less public sort of dating. Like, we barely saw any pictures of them together. What's your read on her going to this football game, knowing that there's going to be a billion cameras there and they're all going to capture every micro moment of this? Because she clearly wants to be visible in this moment. Yeah, I mean, I'm really glad that you started the show off today by playing Bejeweled because I think that um, you know, that is a song that many Taylor fans think is sort of about her relationship with Joe Alwyn, just this idea that, you know, he clearly was someone who really wanted to be private and Taylor embraced that for a while, maybe even enjoyed that after, you know, the comment she made in 2014, just about how there was this whole, you know, rigmarole surrounding her dating life. She's made comments about, you know, feeling like she's been slut shamed. I mean, that's kind of what blank space and some of the songs on 1989 are about. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that my sense as a big Taylor fan is that like there was a period where she wanted to do the private, I'm a normal person thing, not really show up in public, not get mobbed by the paparazzi. Then maybe, um, you know, she gets a little bit tired of that. I mean, I think I keep going back to the the VMAs. If you think about the mm. VMAs last year, um, when Taylor and Swift and Joe Alwyn were still together, there's this viral video of the two of them after the show, kind of like sprinting to the car that they're supposed to be taking either home or to the after party. Just they look terrified of the idea that anyone might take a photo of them. Mm. Um, and Joe was kind of leading the charge in that. It seems like he is the main one who doesn't really want to be seen. And then this year's VMAs, you know, Taylor is single or maybe she's quietly hanging out with Travis Kelsey, who knows, but she was the star of the entire show. I mean, there was mm -hmm. a camera that was watching her the entire time and she was having the time of her life. And so I think that she's really enjoying this period where, um, you know, she's able to be super public and every, you know, piece of her life is just being scrutinized by fans. I think that, um, as you say, she's been incredibly deliberate about her public image and what gets seen and what doesn't. And I think that she wanted this to be a spectacle and it yeah. was one. He lets her Bejeweled, as they say. Uh, Mel, yes. um, I'd like to maybe frame this in a wider context, okay? Um, the NFL is its own kingdom, and Taylor Swift's empire is its own kingdom. It is giving Cleopatra traveling to stay at Caesar's villa. Like, that is what's happening here. This is the <laughs> union of two great kingdoms, one of which stands to, I think, benefit more than the other one. I think the biggest winner of this relationship has got to be the NFL. You know, what does Taylor Swift showing up to their games, cheering for one of their feel-good stars, what does that do, you think, for the NFL? Well, you know, I said I'm a lifelong NFL fan, and I also am a lifelong recognizer that the NFL is a problematic fave. You yes. know, the NFL as an institution is not like a good force in America or in the world. It is actively evil in a lot of ways. Hmm. Taylor Swift's empire has been 
you know, she is, I would argue, one of the most powerful people in the world right now. She yes. is one of the most famous people in the world. By I don't know far. if you'd find an away team for that argument. I don't think anyone would be like, no, Mel, I disagree. No, I, in this room, especially, I <laughs> think we all here can agree. <laughs> this is a very pro that argument room, but yes, 100%. It, it, exactly. And I, I think that, you know, her hitching her wagon to the beast that is the NFL is great for them. I mean, we saw Travis Kelsey jersey sales went up by like 400% just because she showed up at the Kansas City. It's not like they were low before. It's not like they were like, you know, it's not like he was like a nobody before. No, he's one of the most popular players. His like Instagram following like quadrupled this week. And, you know, I think that and, and also, you know, for further, the, the NFL has been courting Taylor Swift to do the Super Bowl halftime show for years at this point. And she's basically said, I'm bigger than that. Like, without saying that, she's like, I'd rather do the Eros tour. I'd mm-hmm. rather be doing everything else I'm doing right now, you know, and which makes sense because if they had the Taylor Swift do the Super Bowl halftime show, there would not be enough people there going there for football. There would be people going to see the Eros tour come rest into 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. And so I think the that, halftime uh, show also doesn't pay. That's no, right. <laughs> and she's making so much money. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, this is very intentional, but I also think that it is a PR boon for the NFL. It is a feel good to have all the Swifty power come into, again, this problematic institution and say, no, it's great. Look at him. Look at his little mustache. Look at him do his little touchdown dance. That's so good. Yay. Uh, so it's it's a big boon for the NFL. Uh, Tyler, to me, you know, the, the attention that this is getting is actually not that different from like peasants who are watching two, you know, royals from two different kingdoms getting married. And we're like, okay, this is why we get invested in the story because it's the marriage of two great kingdoms. But I should also say famous women aren't always embraced by football fans. I'm thinking here of Jessica Simpson as like a really famous example of this. But it seems in this particular case that Swifties are on board. Football fans are on board. Uh, the NFL changed its bio to like, you know, <laughs> Taylor was here um, on, on social media. How do you think this pairing plays into the fantasy of the American dream and who deserves to be put on a pedestal, do you think? Well, I think it really is just a testament to the power of Taylor in the sense that like, You're right. You know, people like Jessica Simpson and, you know, Kim Kardashian, um, you know, dated Reggie Bush for a while. I mean, women have been pilloried for dating NFL players. Um, And I think that Taylor can kind of do anything. I mean, I think she's just on a different level at this point. And so, like, she truly does court the kind of fan base where, like, if she is seen, you know, going to someone's football game, those Swifties will then go and buy the jerseys and they will learn what football is and, you know, how many downs there are. Like, it's been incredible, incredible just seeing Swifties teach themselves, you know, what, how football games are played online. Um, but I think, like, um, in terms of the the American fantasy that we're seeing here, I mean, I think that, like, um, just these the imagery that has come out of the relationship, you know, they mm. leave the game in um a literal getaway car you know a, a convertible, convertible That's yeah right. with yeah. the top down um you know they go to a restaurant um you know where they've rented the entire place out apparently you know according to like unconfirmed reports they spent the whole night on a party bus with donna kelsey on it i mean i do think that there's something very um i don't know like a, elite about this relationship mm-hmm. and something extremely all-american about it and mm-hmm. this is you know a woman taylor you know taylor swift who has dated maddie healy joe alwyn tom hiddleston <laughs> calvin harris harry styles i mean she likes british guys right um and so i think that there is like a very all-american aspect to it um that's that's super interesting to me this is actually this is the tea party that's what this is ha- this is the boston yeah. tea party this is a repatriation of the constitution is what's going on here mel uh last word to you travis and taylor have not like officially confirmed their dating as far as we know but one football game that's all it took and my timeline is packed with all these videos of before and during and after i've seen social media posts about them getting married is this healthy is this healthy for us to be this invested into an unconfirmed relationship do you think I mean, my biggest takeaway from this is that Travis Kelsey is in a hole that he will not be able to get out of. There's kind of the only <laughs> the only exit strategy from this is marrying Taylor Swift. Like, because <laughs> if he if the relationship falls apart in some way, the Swifties are going to murder him. If it somehow impacts his performance on the field, the football plan fans are going to murder him. And so I feel I do feel for this guy. And I feel like some of the photos coming out, the the people online were commenting on that on Sunday being like, oh, this is a man who realized that he is trapped. Like he has (laughs) gone himself into a situation that's great, like wonderful, you know, hanging out, just friends. But you cannot be like just hanging out, just friends with Taylor Swift. That's not it's not how the world works. And so I'm very curious to see 
where this goes in in the coming months because he's gonna have to thread a needle to to get out of this scot-free listen two great kingdoms two great kingdoms tyler last word to you on this is it healthy for us to be this invested into a relationship of course not but Mm. i don't think that anyone um you know, is in a fan of the NFL or a Taylor Swift super stand because they, you know, are interested in their health. <laughs> <laughs> that is an excellent point and an excellent place to leave it. Tyler, <laughs> Mel, this has been a delight. We don't have time to keep talking about this because there's other stuff we want to talk about. Mel, there's another big story this week that you've been thinking about. You're going to stick around. But Tyler, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You let me be jeweled. And I appreciate you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. Of course. Tyler Foggett is a senior editor at The New Yorker. Mel Woods is a senior editor at Extra Magazine in Vancouver. Mel, dude, let's get into it. There's a new season of American Horror Story. We're going to listen to a bit of the trailer right now. You are an A-list star now. Focus on the good. What a pretty dream. All this will be worth it once we meet our perfect baby. I want that too. What a pretty dream. That woman, I think she's following me. Do you want an Oscar? Do you want it as much as a baby? Yes. American Horror Story is now is in its 12th season. This is an anthology series, which means that every season tells a whole new story, entirely different set of characters, a brand new cast. This year's season is called Delicate, and it stars... Kim Kardashian in her first major role. Kim plays as publicist to an up-and-coming actor played by Emma Roberts. Episode 2 airs tonight. Mel, listen, you've seen the first episode. We're going to talk about this. Are you excited? Are you ready to tell people an American Horror Story? I am very excited for this conversation. Okay, let's do it. Um, Let's say, I think we should, first of all, right off the top, say this show has never been afraid of a stunt cast. They love a stunt cast. That's true of the horror genre in general. Paris Hilton in House of Wax, Drew Barrymore, killed off in the opening scene of Scream. There's always an intention behind casting these people, particularly. How do you think Kim Kardashian fits into the the great tradition of, of stunt casting? Yeah, I mean, I think American Horror Story and its kind of sister properties in the Ryan Murphy universe have also really embraced stunt casting. I think back to Lady Gaga in the hotel season, very memorably, one Mm -hmm. of my favorite instances from this series. And actually, I think Kim K fits in really well. You know, I, I think that she is not actually a strange as a stranger to acting as a lot of people think like you, Mm. you know, keeping up with the Kardashians is not like documentary (laughs) you know like the girlie's been putting in work and i think that the the sort of what she's being asked to do here to be this kind of cold publicist bitchy girlfriend Mm -hmm. to emma roberts's character is you know not that far away from being kim kardashian the person and so i think she's actually pretty prepared for this and i do think that it makes the season really intriguing to come into and i think it will keep people watching to see how far she goes and how deep into acting she goes because i think the first episode left a little bit of that to, to be desired but i'm excited to see where it goes so in the first episode like you don't you're saying you don't quite see like you don't watch it and go kim kardashian great actor like that's not the impression you walk away from i mean she's not asked to do a lot though i think okay. that she, what she's asked to do she delivers just fine which again are some like snappy little one-liners some like terse phone calls that sort of stuff some some walking around but i think when the whole horror aspect of the show comes to her yeah um you know mostly it's been around emma roberts so far i think that that is when we're going to get to see her hopefully let loose a little bit uh we should say because every episode every season of american horror story follows a different story this one is based on a novel by danielle valentine let's talk about the first episode how does that set up the premise that is to come for the rest of the season yeah, so I think, you know, you can describe American Horror Story seasons, you know, I said earlier, the hotel season by like, usually a symbol, single moniker like that. That's not necessarily what it's titled. You know, you have the witch season, you've got the haunted house season, you've right. got the weird <laughs> Trump cult season. Sure. Uh, if, if I were to say that for this season, I would say it's the pregnancy season. You know, it is mm. about the horrors, the body horrors, particularly around women's bodies uh, related to pregnancy, IVF, giving birth. And that's what the book is tied about, too. You know, it's about this actor who's 
trying to get pregnant with her husband uh, and kind of encountering spooky, scary horror aspects all around that. You know, you look at the trailer, you see a lot of spiders and you see in the posters, you see Cara Delevingne with a big syringe and big mm. rubber gloves. And I think it's all tied into kind of the horror of of birth, of fertility. And that's not something that's an unfamiliar trope, but I, mm. I it's a new space for American Horror Story to be exploring. And it's interesting to have Kim Kardashian be the spokesperson or like one of the faces for this because like she's someone who's talked a lot um, about fertility, about the process of having children, um, and she's been criticized a lot um, in, the, in very publicly for the different choices that she's made um, with regards to motherhood. We should say this series is part of Ryan Murphy's enormous and ever-expanding TV universe. He's the showrunner on Glee, on Pose, on American Crime Story, and a lot of other shows. Some of them, big hits. Others, yikes. Uh, hey, you wrote a story last year about how Ryan Murphy must be stopped. Mel, what do you got against Ryan Murphy? I mean, I think that I, I wrote that piece in particular in response to last season of American Horror Story, which mm. was the New York, which was set in the 1980s in New York uh, around a serial killer targeting gay men. It was an allegory for AIDS. You know, you know, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that Ryan Murphy's productions have gone deep into this kind of obsession with queer trauma and with mm. kind of hurting and traumatizing queer and trans people in ways that kind of happens over and over again. I think one of the most egregious was Dahmer, um, the, the, the kind of not part of American Horror Story, but definitely adjacent to adjacent, it, the, the yeah. Netflix series. And so I, I think that he has a, a familiar stable of things he goes to. And one of those is queer trauma. And I think I and a lot of other fans are kind of getting tired of it and and would love for him to stop doing that and maybe take a break and do some other things. <laughs> I mean, I, the idea of Ryan Murphy taking a break seems implausible to me. He appears to be tireless. Listen, for the first time in 12 seasons, Ryan Murphy is not the showrunner for American Horror Story. He's handed those reins over to Haley Pfeiffer, or sorry, Hallie Pfeiffer. What do you hope she retains from the best of the series? And also, where do you hope she takes it in terms of, hey, a, a, a Ryan Murphy-less direction? I hope that the series maintains that, you know, American Horror Story is at its best for me when it's campy. Mm. You know, my favorite season is season three, the witch season. And, you know, when you have a like redheaded witch burning at the stake shouting Balenciaga, that's that's <laughs> what I want out of American Horror Story. I want Kathy Bates's head in a box. Right. Like I want. We I are want here for camp. Of, Give the people we're here camp. for camp. Yeah, we're here for silly stuff. And, yeah. you know, again, the casting of Kim K, I think helps with that a lot and really kind of points towards that. So I'm hopeful that she's keeping with that. And I do think that having a woman come and lead an American Horror Story season is good for the series. When we talk about that kind of dicey history with marginalized folks, that to have particularly this series that is, again, based on an existing property and are so centered on women's bodies and fertility and all these things. I'm excited to see a different creative mind kind of lead the charge on that. Got to tell you, the notion of being excited for a new American Horror Story season after 12 seasons of the show is quite remarkable. Mel, I appreciate you being here. I'm going to watch it. You talk me into it. I'm going to watch the first episode and I'll see you after the second episode. We'll talk about it. Mel, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks so, so much for having me. Of course. Mel Woods is a senior editor at Extra Magazine in Vancouver. American Horror Story is streaming right now on Disney+. Plus. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. What you're hearing right now is a bit of music from Nadia Ukraine. It's a ballet benefit performed by the National Ballet of Ukraine. Nadia means hope in Ukrainian. And before I let you go, I wanted to tell you about something really exciting. The National Ballet of Ukraine is coming to Canada next year on tour. That tour is going to begin in January in Quebec City, but then it's going to continue across the country. We're talking about Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, and more. That tour is a part of a fundraising campaign to help with humanitarian aid in Ukraine. Nat Natalia Matsak is a principal ballerina with the National Ballet. Here she is describing the power of art in a time of war. But I do believe that artists have a role to play in this war, whether on the battlefield or the stage. We are embarking on this Canadian tour, not simply to show our Ukrainian culture to the world. Let this ballet be a reminder 
that we are a nation of people united by so much more than a common enemy. That's Natalia Matzak speaking yesterday. Tickets for Nadia Ukraine are on sale now. And that is it for our show today. Hey, my name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. Thanks for hanging out with us today. I'm going to be back tomorrow. I sure hope to see you then. <laughs>